school. We've all been there. It's boring, mundane, repetitive, and most often not catered to how we learn best. But why does it have to be that way? It was always status quo until I met a teacher that would flip my experience on its head. Mr. Akins. His class was different. He knew that students were capable of so much more than we had been given credit for. Topics were brought to life and curiosity, discussion, debate turned his class into the best part of my day. I was tired of sharing stories about Mr. Akins and the crucial impact it had on my love for learning. So I've decided to bring him to everyone. This is the best teacher I've ever had podcast. Hello and welcome to what is the first inaugural, not not second take, but the very first of yeah, right. the best teacher I've ever had podcast. I am Ryan Grimmett and with me, my good friend and teacher and uh, mentor, Mr. Eric Akins. Eric, how's it going? Hello, Ryan. How are you doing this good. evening? This evening. It's not in July, is it? Yeah. So uh, I guess for those who don't, I guess maybe do some context, We this is not our first time recording our intro episode. No, this, in fact... It was interesting because I did the Coeur d'Alene Triathlon this summer, the Ironman. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting, the the people, the timers and the official records when they were working on it, uh, they lost everything. So they made <laughs> me do it all over again right there. It was crazy. You know, I had to do the, the two-mile swim, the 110-mile bike ride, and then 26 miles, you know. And 375 yards. It was those last <laughs> 375 yards, the second time round. No, we're, we're saying this because we actually did do a recording in a studio here in Spokane, Washington. We wanted the tip things off with the two of us in the same uh, same room instead of uh, six, seven, eight hundred miles apart and online. But um, somehow it got lost in the ether in translation. Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson scarpered with it to <laughs> Japan, apparently, and uh, we couldn't find it. And they couldn't find it either. And we did a second episode as well, all about the Greeks. It was all, it was all Greek to us, but apparently more Greek to them. So we're here again. And uh, we're going to kick things off again. We're going to launch tonight. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and obviously, we you know really wanted to kind of get things out sooner. We have been kind of, um, I'll kind of give a backstory here. So I had this, um, you know, it's been almost 15, probably 15 years since I was first in a class with, with Mr. Akins. And, um, you know, as, as I've grown up and, and gone through school and now my professional life, there's been stories and elements of, I, I think of what was different about your class that always stuck with me. And it was a class that I really enjoyed and, and this concept that, you know, that were intriguing and, and insightful and, and, and kind of paused me to think about things differently. And you would come up from time to time. I would talk about, you know, teachers or I would, you know, uh, reference a great Shakespeare class that we had in kind of a non-traditional way. Um, and as I thought about it, and maybe, maybe more so over the kind of course of coronavirus and the pandemic, I, mm. I said, you know, how, how could I potentially capture that or, or potentially pursue, you know, something that was so dear to me that, you know, has been since long kind of disconnected. And so I reached out and, uh, you know, obviously wanted to connect. We've been, I think, you know, friends on, on Facebook here and yeah, there, but, sure. you know, probably haven't meaningfully chatted for a long time. And basically right, prior to this summer. Yeah. Yeah. And basically said, Hey, uh, Eric, I have an idea for, for something. I want to get your opinion. And, um, I guess kind of from your side, um, what was your reaction to that? Yeah. We were chatting on Facebook, right? And then you said mm-hmm. you had a little uh, proposal for me and I thought, Oh, he's getting kind of open-minded there. Um, <laughs> um, no, at, at first, right. My first reaction, of course, was flattered that you would think of, uh, of me in that context. And, uh, particularly given the title of, uh, of the show, um, but nonetheless, I, I thought, yeah, this is, this is exciting. This, I, you know, I, for myself, I, I've been retired from Central Valley High School where I taught you, Ryan, of course, as you know, and, um, for seven years now, six years, I guess. And, um, and then I've been teaching at Gonzaga University. And I know you were sort of thinking about doing this a little bit later, but, um, graduate seminars there, primarily in history of the English language. But, um, a podcast like this is great because it gives me an opportunity to, Go and talk about the things we talked about. You know, I, I as a teacher there that I dealt into for over twenty years, and uh, both. Um, gosh, you had me. I think I, at least for two classes, perhaps I, maybe honors English sophomore year too. I think. I think um, and then I can't remember if you had class. me for U.S. history as well, but the, certainly AP European history and Shakespeare. So, um, got a little bit of everything. Um, 
Yeah. yeah and I think um, what's, I, you know, is, is interesting about this idea is as I was exploring, I, I think about, you know, in my, at least in my professional life, a lot of the, the, the studies and the classes I've taken that are more practical and application to what I do from a day-to-day perspective could not be farther from Shakespeare and European history. Mm. They're almost completely irrelevant yet. So many of those underlying themes and, and, you know, um, topics and, and really kind of inquisitive questions about life really have kind of formed deeper thinking about all aspects of, you know, my life. And I think those are where oftentimes we find, you know, meaning is when we can actually step away and have some other pursuit that's different than maybe our day to day, um, and allow ourselves to, you know, be more abstract or, or look more holistically. And those are the things that for me were groundbreaking from that class and, and what it kind of, oh. what it kind of, you know, put a foundation and, it, and I think we can talk about this, but you know, it was not that case for me across all those classes. I was by no means mm-hmm. a, a stereotypical, you know, book smart mm-hmm. student with the, you know, exceptional GPA yet there was classes by which I excelled. And I think you can track that back to that were very challenging. right? Yeah. That to the and engagement you, that you could excel at them. Right. Yeah. I think too, I, I believe any, um, uh, most teachers, one of the, their primary goals is to help students uh, learn how to learn. Uh, in a sense, teach themselves how to learn more effectively. And so when you talk about, you know, oftentimes, you know, these classes, Shakespeare and European history don't have a lot of relevance to many tech jobs or engineering jobs, we can say. But in many ways, of course, um, just like in taking a math class, if you're going to go into the humanities or some job that doesn't involve math, but they do indeed help um, mold the brain, help um, basically the individual learn how to learn more effectively, develop those skills. It is a process of molding the brain. It really actually literally happens, of course, when you're learning. You're, when you learn something new, we've talked about, um, we did talk about this in the initial opening episode, but uh, for example, if you learned that Shakespeare was born on April 23rd, 1564, at least that he was baptized three days after that, and so we say he was born April 23rd, 1564. And in order to learn that, that silly little fact right there, it's interesting because, right, he died on his birthday then 52 years later in 1616, so kind of interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you were to learn that, actually, and have that up in your head, like we were, learned state capitals or the elements on the periodic table, uh, you actually are remaking the geography of your brain. You're, you're creating a new synaptic connection. You get a little axon going, a neuron that is, of course, and you got a dendrite on the other end, and it, um, you're making a new wrinkle, not in time, but in your brain. And so something physiological, and this is something, of course, it's interesting, right? It, it goes, uh, we'll start off with the Greeks when we start uh, delving into Western civilization. Um, and they were talking um, really uh, intently about how do we learn things? How do we know that we know something? And of course, now we have a lot of the, the science to back that up, this whole process about what go, what's involved in learning, in learning something new. And so here I am, of course, a humanities teacher talking about the reshaping of the topography or the cartography. Of, of the brain itself, the physical makeup, but it makes sense, right? Obviously, we have to, it's not, the brain is not spiritual, particularly, mm-hmm. but there might be some aspect to it, and that's something we'll look into, too, during this podcast, right? That's what the philosophers tried to figure out for thousands of years. And, uh, you know, when I was thinking about topics, obviously, I, I think one of the things we'll definitely come back to is, you know, one of the main themes of the structure of the podcast is really, you know, history kind of as a basis, because it's a great spot where you have amazing expertise, and then really just other topics that, you know, really kind of dive into this sense of, you know, the, you know, the love of learning and a way to kind yeah, of look at sure. deeper topics and, and whatever it may be, whether it's distant or close, um, you know, to to you physically or geographically or or culturally, um, that really allow you the space to think about things in a way that you know enhance a perspective that thing can then relay to other areas of of your studies. I remember this is probably one of my biggest you know challenges looking at the university system is that because it's so focused on your degree and kind of the track you're on, mm. that you really have very little flexibility to take other classes that really would augment that learning and make you a more rounded, you know, well-rounded mm-hmm. thinker. Uh, one of my, you know, one of my best friends is, in a, is a, a software engineer who got his undergrad in philosophy and then quickly found out that to get a job, he would have to go on yeah. to do much more school and decided, you know, he didn't want to do that. Philosophy shop doesn't quite cut it, no. Yeah, so he went back to school and got a master's in computer science. And as I worked with him, he had probably mm-hmm. the most 
you know, original and, you know, different takes on p- complex problems that were very, you know, math and science driven, but mm. his, his kind of, you know, philosophy kind of undergirdings, let him look at problems in a very different way. Mm. And because of it, he was invaluable, um, both yeah. on the team and as an individual that you wanted to work with. And I always think about that story of, you know, how do we also round ourselves and not have, you know, this burnout between what we're asked to do and, and not be exposed. And sometimes that requires you to pick up books in your, you know, on your free time and, and say, yeah, yeah. my, my commitment to learning has got to be on my own, you know, volition and, and, and go pick up things because they interest me. Yeah. You started off by right, um, what you were just saying uh, with that notion of history. And it is true. I think it, it is not uncommon at all for um, a lot of people to struggle with history classes in high school and then perhaps in college as well. And then five, six, seven, eight years, 10 years later uh, really become you know, as as they begin to become more engaged in the world events around them and uh, even the world, perhaps, in travels and, of course, with the Internet, that uh, they begin to see the value of history. And there's so many, so many different media in which you can tap into now. Of course, a podcast, for instance, but books on tape. There's um, so many different uh, options on YouTube uh, that, yeah, it's almost endless. You know, the, the things that are basically at our beck and call, we can just immediately or you plug into this and have... Very good resources. I was, we were talking, I was talking with a friend, a colleague, and just in the notion that if we wanted to find out about Taoism or Buddhism back in the 1970s, we would have to go and get books on the matter. There was really, or find some expert somewhere. Um, you know, there's the whole series, what masterclass? I guess I'm giving a little tip of the hat to, uh, to a business here. But nonetheless, you know, again, people are really intrigued by this, this mm-hmm. idea of being able to, um, go back to school almost and to study these things, which they are now finally motivated for. Mm-hmm. And before that, they maybe didn't find a lacking in the teacher or the professor, but, you know, that they realized that they weren't quite ready for it. And nonetheless, of course, in high school and in college, uh, the teachers have to try. We want to prepare our citizens. You figure that they are graduating from high school at the age of 18, college, you know, 22 or so. And these are young adults and they get to make the, their votes count for as much as uh, yours does now, right? Mm-hmm. So um, your average Scary 18 year thought. old. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's um, yeah, that this, uh, the whole notion of teaching as a profession and then learning, of course, and any good teacher, I think will also tell you that they never, they never stop being a learner mm-hmm. that um, you can learn so much from your class too. And of course you're going to learn about people, psychology, um, the different stories. And that's one of the things too, I think uh, for a teacher, And we'll talk about that, I suppose, um, the different things that make a great teacher. But if they can look on their students, you know, they see them as people and they also look at them, the the story, the backstory of their lives. And that was always something that I I, strive to do would be to um, always know what their narrative is, what's going on, as much as I could possibly learn. And, of course, it rounds out. It gives you a little bit more of a three-dimensional take on who these people are. And and that's the same, of course, for... uh, someone a CEO of a company or in any kind of situation where you have a hierarchy. Hopefully the people at the top are trying to understand and get to know the people um, at the bottom. But of course there is no, you have to say that that implies that someone's better than someone else. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's a community in the classroom. If you can kind of create that environment and that it's a first among equals, because you, know, you have to have that a captain of a ship always where I'm mixing my metaphors like crazy here. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's, you know, the, Mr. Keating in Dead Poet Society used that Walt Whitman poem of Captain, My Captain, Mm -hmm. as if he were the captain of that ship that he was sailing through the strange waters. And yeah, that's that's one of the things that a teacher does. Yeah. And uh, I love that reference because it's one of the, you know, I think one of the movies that I think probably was instilled as a favorite through your class and and one that I I think I watch probably yearly and as an inspiration Mm -hmm. for the artwork for the podcast. And I think a lot of that was, you know, kind of that impact that you you had on me personally. And I love your, your comment about the content because it's interesting to see this 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 kind of instant change with the emergence of the internet. It's now this question of um, content being readily available and for any topic. But now I feel like the challenge is almost how do you sift through the content to find out really, you know, what's you know mm-hmm. worth its its weight in terms of accuracy and, and perspective. And you almost have to do more work to get yourself educated, but you're accountable because it's available to you. You know, anyone can pull right. up their smartphone and they can search and Google and within, you know, five seconds, they can have a hundred hits and then how do you sift through those, you know, that, that list of content to figure out what's actually true? Right. Most people uh, fall, um, basically fall victim to confirmation bias. And uh, basically they just look up sources that will confirm all their prejudices and biases, which they've been able to 
you know, build up over years, if not decades. And that's what they they want to, you know, basically have those confirmed with the things which they already think they know. Mm -hmm. And that's an unfortunate aspect of, of media. And when we get into history, it's obviously a little bit different. But nonetheless, uh, you now have, of course, um, books which are being written um, with a definite agenda, historical agenda, and even revisionist. And it's very alarming. Uh, that's not the approach of scholars when they approach history. You know, they are writing, trying to be as objective as possible. It's it's impossible mm -hmm. to be objective in writing history and teaching history. And um, and I know we'll, we'll talk about what makes uh, you know a teacher a good teacher objectively. Well, that too is all really impossible to say. I don't think there is an objective, ideal, Platonic model or you know ideal for that. Uh, these are things. Um, you, and, and I think that's any student will say that too. That when they start thinking about their favorite teachers, and their favorite teachers will be very, very different. Mm -hmm. And just like um, a, a parent really can't say who their favorite kid <laughs> is, you know, the, and teachers would be hard pressed to say who their favorite students are. Right. You know, it's it's the variety. It's it's that, of course, which makes it so wonderful. One of the aspects which I loved about teaching and still do is that each individual, of course, brings this whole universe of experience with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think the as a student, what's invaluable about that is you have a you know a series of classmates that vary in terms of intelligence and social mm. and, and emotional intelligence, and you know you get to kind of take advantage that can of learning. Yeah, and often oftentimes it can be helpful, especially if you've got you know if you see people excelling or you see people who are really following through and asking questions and it, you know, encourages you to engage or, you know, you, you feel like there's a spot by which the class has changed, not from just a teacher, you know, telling you this is, mm -hmm. you know, history and this Absolutely. is the dates, but rather, you know, what, what do you think? Or, or turning that back mm -hmm. on the class oftentimes is the best way to find out what questions you really right. have and, and how much you know. Um, and I think yeah, the Socratic method, right? That, and that was one of the, the core principles and methods that I tried to incorporate into my classroom. To have everyone engaged, everyone involved, and uh, you know, also at the same time to feel safe enough well, to use that really um, interesting phrase now, the safe place. But sure, mm -hmm. you want to, just like a family should be that way around a dinner table, that people feel comfortable there. I had so many students over the years who said that they felt like they were going home when they walked into my class. They felt um, as if this was a place that they could, you know, express themselves and articulate their, you know, their feelings. Um, so oh, that's great, of course. You know that's exactly what the environment you, you want to create. You don't want to create this adversarial environment, uh, which was kind of, definitely very old school, way before my time as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion that's the way the teacher should be a dictator, and uh, the students, of course, would be um, the subjects to the dictator. Agreed. And yeah, and that's just not going to cut it in in today's world. Yeah, not in the United States. Yeah, that's challenging. So I, I'd be remiss if we didn't spend at least a few minutes probably giving a little bit of a background on, sure. on you personally. I think this is, I mean, th hopefully for a lot of people that will tune in, um, you know, they don't have the benefit of having the experience directly in your class. And so I think your background, um, specifically kind of where you grew up as well as your family and, and your kind of your education and, and kind of mm -hmm. how you found your way to teaching kind of is part of that story and kind of builds up kind of why you teach in a certain way and kind of what makes you character. So maybe just give us a little bit of your background on kind of, how you came to kind of ultimately come to teaching, um, but kind of your maybe a little bit of history. The David Copperfield shtick, huh? Yeah. Once upon a time, or I can do more of the Holden Caulfield without the language, <laughs> without the purple prose. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, grew up in Southern California, Laguna Beach, California, back um, in, I was a kid in the 1960s. I was pretty young. You know, people would ask, my students would ask, did you go to Woodstock? Well, I was 10 years old, you know, so uh, I didn't I didn't cross the country. I you know, hitchhiked across the country. Laguna Beach was fantastic back in the 60s and then 70s when I was, uh, late 70s when I was uh, into high school. Uh, this is a, it's an artist colony. My dad was an artist and he was an art professor, art teacher. And uh, he landed in Laguna. He was from the state of Washington. Um, and we fortunately, uh, from my point of view, just given where we did, you know, where I ended up growing up, um, we also, we traveled a lot, extensively traveled, uh, lived in, in England. Um, France, uh, off and on, and again, over, over different periods of years, um, for many years, and then in Switzerland as well. Um, so we're very fortunate in that sense. My mom, she, she had been a singer. She was a, she was a jazz singer. She sang actually at times, um, here in the Northwest in Spokane, Washington. Um, she sang with Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and Louis Armstrong. 
And so, yeah, my parents, you know, as an artist, and um, he was also my dad, interesting. Laguna Beach High School, the mascot, were the artists. That's, I have this on tonight in sort of tribute to him. This was his hat. He was also the football coach. He loved football. He played at Washington State University. It was the Washington State College back in the day. And um, he was uh, the first that he knew of uh, who was an art major and uh, who was also a scholarship player on the football team and probably the last as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed you saw that in the one story that was written about him when he passed, but um, that was a comment that I made. And uh, so we, we uh, yeah, grew up in Laguna Beach, California. Um, my parents' friends were artists and writers and uh, other professors and teachers. And so this was uh, this very engaging environment in which I grew up in. And, and of course, we just, friends would come over and they loved it because our house was just covered with books. You know, we, they'd come into our den or de going downstairs and this the walls and seeing these endless possibilities. And that was it back then again. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, it was books that were the source, of course. Uh, when you opened up a book, that's how you fell through the pages and went through the looking glass, so to speak, and, and second star on the right, straight on to the morning. We can mm -hmm. make this up all the different ways. Sure, of sure. course, people would, yeah, journey <laughs> to other lands, other, you know, to another mode of learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved to, to pick up the different textbooks, history books that uh, my parents had and read them when I was a kid. And so then, yeah, I went to, to college both in um, in Southern California and then in England as well and at university there and uh, graduate school. That's where I first, I, I, I first started teaching college back in the 80s at Washington State University, yeah, back to my roots, mm -hmm. and um, was teaching English there. And then um, one of our stints, my wife and I, we got, we got, I got married and we decided, I talked to her. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of spouses would love it to have their spouse take them to Paris for a couple of weeks. Well, I I ended up taking her for three years, <laughs> and uh, so that was a, a wonderful experience as well. I one of my jobs there in in Paris because of my history background and uh, intensive reading about the neighborhood, about the city, and so I was a walking tour guide. It was the first walking tour company there in Paris, and I would do walking tours uh, for. Because I spoke French uh, for the local French people as well, for Parisians, which was funny, walking around their city and, and informing them about their city. And then there's all sorts of different walking tour companies now, which are, are wonderful for that city. That's You want to walk there, of course. And I, as you know, also, I was a bartender there in an American restaurant. One of the things, uh, the reason why I, I wanted to write, and it's very, I discovered that when you're teaching, it's very challenging to write creatively or you know, in a scholar, scholarly fashion. Um, you always have some, when you're teaching, you always have something you should be doing. And that's, of course, the same thing as a writer. And the two don't dovetail together always very nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I had these uh, random jobs like a tour guide and then as a bartender in an American restaurant, which turned out to be a wonderful experience. Um, entertained my students for decades, right? Mm -hmm. Those stories of being a bartender in Paris, France for a couple of years. And uh, came back then, we, uh, my wife and I, we decided we wanted to have our family here in the States. And uh, we just happened to... Um, get jobs at uh, Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. And this was in the early 90s. And then we stayed here. We've been here ever since. It's, gosh, it's 30 years now we've been in Spokane mm -hmm. and um, raised our two boys here. And they're both in their 20s. Both just had birthdays. And then that's where I encountered you. I was teaching high school then, out, mm -hmm. out in Central Valley High School, one of the best high schools in the state. Shout out to the staff there who was fantastic. I know I appreciate the fact that you said you enjoyed my class and that it was very different than many of the others. Um, and that's there's no doubt, right? Every class is going to be different. And you, it, something about my class, right, was resonated with you and it worked. And um, but in general, right, you have so many dedicated teachers there. Sure. And I'm not just you know, saying that because uh, that was the experience that I had comparing to, let's say, to the school sometimes that my my, my own kids went to. Mm -hmm. There were um, differences. I thought that the teachers probably were of a different caliber where I was teaching, and so that was. Um, and and the administration from time to time even rose to the occasion. So, so that was great. And the kids were fantastic, man. Yeah. Um, what a you know, blessing that was to have this really rich you know world in which to to live and work in. Yeah, and looking back, I mean, as we talk about you know what teachers that you know I enjoyed, and I look back at that time, I said. I, like what an like impossible job. Like I, I remember being like even now looking <laughs> back, like I can clearly recall being insufferable in many ways and uh, i give so much more credit to yeah i don't i don't put up with insufferable very easily <laughs> i mean i just uh, you, you know you that's what sense of humors are for right for teachers you senses of humor you, you try to disarm that yeah and students will come at you like that and and 
Yeah, and I understand what you're saying. That, yeah, and maybe with other teachers, you, you did some of the anecdotes, uh, stories you related, your encounters with some of the other teachers were pretty funny. Yeah, and it sounds like yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess maybe you could be insufferable. You know, yeah, but. I'm sure I definitely can get back into a corner, and I've, I'm sure there are many who could attest that uh, I wasn't always a pleasant little angel. But I think that's part of growing up, and I think the aspect of you know understanding. Well, those that are my job. favorite students. Oftentimes, the ones who were not pleasant little angels, hey, they're much more interesting. Yeah, yeah I and, think yeah. you have at a least a bit of Lucifer in you. Yeah, <laughs> at least an opportunity to then I know you know then expand and grow and then as i think many of you know many of us do as we get older we refine and we look at mm-hmm. you know aspects of our you know our, our immaturity and realize oh yeah that was part of this difficult time of a whirlwind of emotions and you know um, yeah of you know puberty and and class and right. expectations and um you know or just the stress. social life itself yeah, causes or lack thereof mm-hmm. yeah just that's i think why americans were endlessly fascinated by movies about kids in high school that this, because we all we all have been there. It's mm-hmm. something that we've all experienced. It's not something that's in the future. It's something that we've been there, done that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I mean, this every year, right? I don't know how many. Um, right now, it's it's coming up on Halloween, so it's all about crazy teenagers who do um, wild things to put themselves in danger with um, various creatures coming after mm-hmm. them in the night, right? And we would do that. That was one of the things. I don't know if you remember doing that. I can't. It depends on which class. But on Halloween, we would always. Uh, I bring in uh, different candles, jack o' lantern, and we would turn off the lights and we would tell stories. Yeah. That was always fun. Yeah, yeah, um, it was great. We would tell stories. I would start off. I always had two or three, and then uh, other students they would definitely get into it then. And then you know, ask them different things where they've been in scary situations. Um, you know, of course, within reason. You mm-hmm. know. Um, and so that that was always yeah that was great fun. It was um, something we did every year. You know, that's in keeping. I tell them a little bit about the the Celtic background of Halloween, you know, how it began, mm-hmm. uh, and morphed into a Christian holiday, like so many of the the holidays that we have. Mm-hmm. They began as pagan and became Christian. So yeah, that was fun. I, one thing I didn't mention about as far as you know, since I've seen you, because you graduated about yeah fourteen years ago, I believe, and um, the. In 2012, 2013, my oldest boy had just finished high school and my younger son had just finished middle school. And we had always, we had traveled over um, to to Europe Mm -hmm. um, quite a few times with our kids already. We had spent time in in Provence in the south of France a summer one time. But we wanted to give them the experience uh, of spending a lot of time in Paris, France. And so uh, both my wife and I took a sabbatical and for the year and we went to live in Paris in 2012 and 2013 with our two sons. And that was an amazing experience for both my wife and me, but I th- hopefully I, I believe so for the two boys as well. Uh, you know, my son, my older boy, Callum, who, you know, for him to say, well, yeah, I could take a gap year to Paris, France you know, for a year before I start university. Mm-hmm. I could see doing that. And, and then my younger son, of course, before he went into ninth grade, he said, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll go to Paris with you. And they had been three times prior to that, but yeah. Um, this was, yeah. And so that was something we, we did. I remember at the time, a lot, people just were kind of shocked. They just had never heard of anyone doing something like that before. Mm-hmm. And, uh, taking a year off, you know, oftentimes you'll hear about people, say in your line of work, who maybe who get transferred for a year or two. And that's you know, fairly common or not uncommon. Mm-hmm. And this, in this case, we were reelected to do it. And, um, it was a great break too, uh, for me. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, since I'm teaching European history too, of course, it was it was wonderful to dive back into uh, the actual um, place where it all happened, where the history happened. Yeah, and I I think it's um it's I, I actually didn't get a chance, but often you would also take students to to Europe yeah. and, to, and to on trips, and I think that was another great opportunity for not just talking about these places, but actually bringing students. Um, phys- yeah. Physically to them and talking about you know uh, being yeah I didn't want to take the one on the can tour you know, one of the can tours uh, that's a that actually pays for the teacher and those were always way too short you end up spending one or two nights in places that one so we would go and spend a week in London a week in Paris and a week in Rome and so three weeks and it would cost a lot less than those companies that are in it for profit of course that's what they're doing that's mm-hmm. their profit and um, yeah and since I had spent time there as a tour guide and of course I'm a I'm a teacher and I speak um, the languages uh, in question. You, you know, in England, I do okay, at least. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's uh, having gone to school there and university, yeah, I can I can manage to get by in mm-hmm. England. So, yeah, it's 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 a wonderful way to end the year after you know teaching them about the history and for them then to make the connection. 
to actually go to Versailles. Yeah. We've been talking about the Sun King, of course, and to um, see the painting of Notre Dame when Napoleon was coronated, when he took the, the crown from the Pope's hands and he crowned himself and there and stand right on that spot in Notre Dame. And you can't do it right now. They do hope to have it open in time for... Uh, 2024 for the Olympics. The Olympics are going to be in Paris in 2024, so they definitely want to have Notre Dame reopened mm -hmm. by the summer of 2024, and they can work like crazy people when they need to. So, yeah, well, and even to have that done. I think even um, as you know, um, many of our students, we, we grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and a lot of the really the kind of notable spots in American history are on the East Coast. And so yeah. many of us have not even you know, had the opportunity. I have actually more recently with um, my current company that's based out of DC, had the opportunity to spend more time out there. And mm -hmm. it is very different seeing these amazing, you know, uh, museums and these, you know, buildings that are the foundation yeah. of the country when you're up close in person and you're reading these quotes and seeing the monuments, they are very different than reading about them in a book. Yeah, going to a battlefield where the Civil War was fun. You know, Gettysburg, you, they're invariably national parks, mm -hmm. the various battlefields, and it's it's an amazing experience. And then, of course, the the glut of museums in Washington, D.C., New York City, Philadelphia, that one can visit, not to mention the historical sites themselves, Independence Hall, one thinks of immediately in Philadelphia and in Boston. You know, there's one after another of the you know, Bunker Hill, the North Church, of course. Um, so it's just... Yeah, what an opportunity to go back and you know, a combination of going to the actual spots where these things happened and then, of course, seeing going into the museums, uh, taking advantage of that. And that's the same, of course, in going to Europe, where you have uh, thousands of your years of history and not just hundreds of your years of right. history. And, and that's, of course, we had thousands of years. There was thousands um, of years of history here in the United States, too, or what is now the United States in North America. Uh, we just, uh, it's much more difficult for archaeologists and anthropologists to piece it all together because of the lack of written records. Right. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a very rich history in North America, and it's a wonderful field to delve into. Uh, but the challenges, of course, being literacy. And, it, you know, right, the, the three different spots, four different spots in the world where it, be, it all sort of began in the same place. It was interesting, you know, that, that human beings and the human civilization were apparently ready at the same time. It's all. You're going down about 28, well, 2800 BC is when BCE, when in China, the what's now India, Middle East, and what is Mesopotamia, of course, and then Egypt, those four different civilizations developing writing, more or less at the same time, mm -hmm. concurrently. But that, that we can talk about in, in the next episode as we delve into the Greeks, jump into that. Yeah, and that was, you know, one of the challenges is where do we start? You know, where um, mm -hmm. I think the goal is not to do um, a, you know, chronological uh you know, stint of, of AP European history, but rather start somewhere notable um, that kind of is important. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, one of the things is as far as thematically is, um, you know, to dive into topics that are you know interesting and hopefully mm -hmm. places that are less covered to your point of, we have a lot of deep history about, you know, a lot of, you know, European history and, you know, the American history where it's more recent, but, you know, some of the countries and, and areas of the world that usually we're less familiar with in terms of being exposed in our natural kind of, um, you know, schools or, or part of the curriculum. I think those are, are oftentimes just as interesting, but they, you know, haven't got as much limelight because they just aren't, you know, they aren't popularized or they haven't become trendy for whatever reason. So I think we'd love to dive into some of those topics, I think, um, yep. and even an opportunity to do, you know, episodes that completely divulge and do a big take on a completely different area, but the same time um, or same general time. Yeah, and, and, and certainly we are going to be uh, using a as a scaffolding a chronology. That's uh, as as we go throughout the year, it, it only makes sense. You know, one of the best ways, of course, to construct a sense of history. It is wonderful to have that context. And so, if someone is introducing a new concept, a new idea to you about, let's say, something you didn't know about the 14th century. Oh, that's that's right. That's when the Black Death happened. When was it again? Oh, 1347 to 51. 13. Gosh, that's that's in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. But if you have the scaffolding, um, and then you, you you picture a scaffolding, of course, along a building, let's say like Notre Dame Cathedral, and it's right. fairly empty, right? And you just begin, you can put in the things that are necessary there. And that's that's what you want as uh, someone who, a student of history, you want to begin to be able to build this scaffolding, this framework, this foundation, whatever metaphor, you choose it, mm -hmm. uh, that works for you. And then you begin to um, fill it in you know, throughout your life. And that's you know, with my two sons. That's Either history teachers would comment on that or philosophy professors at, at college, the fact that they came in, having been exposed to an awful lot, having been overseas, having lived overseas, uh, that they um, 
have been introduced and exposed, inculcated with things, with ideas uh, that a lot of people are not. Mm-hmm. Um, and as, as as I was when I was growing up, too, I was very fortunate. I do see it as being fortunate for the most part. It wasn't as if I had them at home and we were sitting there. I was doing lectures. All right, sit down. We're gonna You're going to learn about the Renaissance today, boys. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, more often than not, they were, uh, you know, bugging me with questions when I was trying to watch football or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's really the goal. And ultimately I think out of, you know, out of my own selfish goals to spend more time with you, first and foremost, I think, mm-hmm. you know, I think what a lot of people find engaging about podcasts and about just continued learning is this, this aspect of, you know, really interesting topics to your point that maybe they just weren't as intriguing when they covered them, you know, at at a younger age or when they first went through them. But now the relevance is much more, you know, notable for their own personal lives. And I think that's where I think we'd love to focus on topics that really cause us to think, examine history, um, see great examples of, you know, um, uh, of people and places and then draw, you know, parallels to our own day and our own lives and, and find out how do we take those and hopefully learn. Um, oftentimes, mm-hmm. you know, we don't, yeah. um, and find out where we failed again and say, man, this is so interesting that we failed right. here again when we had a very clear example, you know, not that long ago of, of why that was a problem. So I think, um, again, that's where we'd love to focus. Um, most and not be afraid to wander a little bit, you know, digress, yeah. you know, as, as you're going through the, you know, if we look upon it as a wandering through a path in the woods, right? I guess Bilbo Baggins, when he's walking through the Mirkwood on his way to the Lonely Mountain, but um, going off the trail because you see the lights in the woods and, yeah, these things you want to explore a little bit uh, when something comes up. That's, that was always a key in the classroom. Mm-hmm. If a student asked you know, an intriguing question, yeah, absolutely, let's let's go down that road for now. And um, you got to be ready to do that, you know, spontaneous, just like if you're a jazz musician and you come up with a new... Um, riff and you want to be able to pursue it you know do a little improvisational jazz um that's the heart of that's the whole nature of the beast right and the same thing in a classroom you want to have that kind of flexibility you have this sense that yeah we're open for anything anything can happen today you know this is this is where where we where we think we're going this is our goal today but we might digress too much we might go off on a tangent and you know who knows? Now, granted, in AP European history, we had a goal to you know, prepare people for this exam, right. this national exam. And uh, yeah, I got, you know, kids sometimes were getting uh, very concerned. A lot of times I would digress too much or we would go into things perhaps that they felt um, they wanted more teaching to the test, but that wasn't really the way that I necessarily approached things. But we would do the uh, evening review sessions right. know, leading up to the test. And yeah. so I gave them opportunities and they could always come in after school if they wanted <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great that's a great transition. So I think one of the the topics I'd love to discuss, um, really, I think is core to really the kind of the, the foundation again of of this podcast is you know what really makes a great teacher, and I think that can be quantitative, it can be qualitative. There's there's so many variables and aspects, mm-hmm. and you know it's not necessarily a perfect science, and what works for one may not work for someone else's personality or even their topic. Um, you know, uh, funny. Uh, uh, jokes and digression might not be actually mm-hmm. helpful in a calculus class um, if you're really trying to focus on, you know, focus uh, core concepts. Eh, you always need a little uh, oh, levity, yeah, I think. You definitely do. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah. so I got the benefit of coming into your class when you had you know, been teaching for multiple years as an educator at that point in, 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 in the high school. When you first came into teaching, um, what was your kind of what was kind of your experience in terms of how, how did you think you were doing or what did you think kind of as you self kind of, um, you know, evaluated your, your experience? Yeah, I think you, it's like an actor on the stage and they can sense how the evening's performance is going. And, and um, as a teacher, when I first started off, again, I was teaching in a university uh, back then. And then, and then when I um, transitioned into high school, when we came back from France, um, you definitely first you, you gauge in the classroom. You see if the kids seem awake, if they're interested. Are 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 they um, coming into the classroom, and then are they staying awake? You, you look at that energy that's in a high school hallway. You, between the the bell rings, the class is over, the kids just immediately stand up. You know, they're it's so interesting. I'm thinking, are you really that excited to go to your next class? And they're going, well, no, I hate my next class, but it just change, right? Get up out of their seat and move. And then, and if you could tap into that energy that's out there in the hallway between classes and bring some of that into the classroom. And it's very difficult because, uh, you, you, know, students develop patterns, exp- expectations. It's the same thing you asked students, uh, well, what would you prefer to have in the classroom? 
And a lot of students will say video. They bring in videos. Mm. And the main reason is so they can check out. It's very passive. And you, if, as soon as you turn off the lights and you start up a video, and it can be a fantastic, it might be a Ken Burns documentary, which I happen to know are fantastic. And yet half the class will be uh, basically fading away into uh, the land of Nod within 30 seconds, it seems, oftentimes. And so uh, for them, they have learned over years that video is a time to check out, mm. to maybe basically turn off the, the neurons in the brain and to not be engaged actively. And so one of the things that you, uh, you notice as a teacher is, uh, are the students becoming active learners? And you can tell. You can definitely uh, just, uh, you can use any kind of situation you want to compare it to, but someone who um, is the, the uh, leader in a workplace, they definitely know if the workers are happy, content, motivated, and you can tell the same thing with your students. And then, of course, they start seeing results. They start doing well. They start getting excited about their learning. They start producing. Um, it's wonderful. It would be wonderful if all the students were to earn an A. I never had a class where that happened. Um, but I definitely, my goal was, right, for the students to be able to aspire towards receiving the top grades if they can, right? And um, this, this, and I, it's amazing students who can. They, they, they couldn't believe it that they were getting A's on something so challenging. And uh, this sense that, wow, finding success. And, of course, students are all motivated by various things, and you try to figure out a way to somehow tap into those. It's very difficult. You know, high school in particular is a challenge. Um, college, a lot of it is, you know, university, teaching university, you, the professor has a lot more leeway. They basically get to go in and teach their way, mm -hmm. and that's it. That's they can, If they want to be a lecturer and lecture, if 60 minutes a day in their class, that's their prerogative. In high school, there's expectations for us to adapt to the students' styles of learning. And so it is definitely more, um, there's more pressure, on a, particularly obviously in an AP class where you're, where the families are going to be spending money for their students to take a test to see if they can get college credit. Right. And um, so, yeah, in that sense. But it just, you can, um, you can sense almost immediately from day one whether you are beginning to be a success using humor too you know i, I wish that um people oftentimes ask well what would you do to try to improve educa public education and boy it's been you you figure what i have not been in public education for years i've been teaching you know, at the graduate school level uh, but i've just looked at the last few years with covid and the unbelievable challenges that public school teachers have been facing and the students themselves and it's gonna it's obviously it's been a game changer education will never quite be the same after what COVID has done. Uh, just, of course, with the connection to be able to learn at home. Sure. And we'll see what, you know, as the system begins to remake itself after after this this um, this rupture that has occurred um, in, in the system. But in, in any kind of um, a teaching situation, any kind of classroom like this, I would say the two things which are just integral to make a classroom environment, to make education more effective is to really improve teacher education. What I would love to see is, is it, public teacher education at, the, at university is comparable to law school or even medical school. One of the things which is almost mind boggling about someone going and getting their master's in, in education so they can teach high school or whatever level it happens to be, is that they're spending an awful lot of money you know, at Gonzaga University, you know, I won't say what it, the tuition is, but you're spending tens of thousands of dollars and then you're going in to do student teaching for however a semester or even longer and you're doing someone else's job and you're not getting paid. You're actually paying to do someone mm -hmm. else's very difficult job. Right. And interns, of course, in, in medicine get paid. And in, in law, uh, certainly a law, legal interns do tend to get paid, but when they're doing their shadowing, and such, they're not getting paid. But nonetheless, there's a prestige to, to law school, which does not exist in public education, in teacher education uh, programs. And I would love to see in teacher education, uh, this is just a little offshoot, but to get acting training, to get to stand-up comedy, to be able to, you know, some of those things which would be wonderful if, if they could bring them. And again, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone is, is going to be a fantastic storyteller. Mm -hmm. As you know, that for me, bringing story, teaching history and uh, English literature as story, after all, that's what English literature is, right. it's story. So you want to teach it as a story. And the same thing with history. Why would you not want to have all these different narratives, which are parallel, right, and talk about them and how they come together into a larger picture, and a bigger story? And um, But the other thing I would do, too, is make classes smaller. 
they're too big. Um, the most public schools are at the limit. You know, they'll have uh, here in Washington, it's 32. Oftentimes in my AP year, uh, they would they would limit it to three sections, and so I would take on a TA as a 33rd student, but they would actually be taking it for credit. Mm-hmm. And um, so I would have, yeah, three, I would have 99 students in, in AP European history. If you teach them. But it's just, it would be ideal if it was about 21, 22, 23, right? About that number. And, uh, you know, again, a lot of college professors think in terms of 12 to 16. But I think um, for high school, I, I think that that's more realistic. And so all that other stuff, the methodology, the, the, the different standardized tests formats that they have, that they end up spending tens of millions of dollars on, I think if you just try to diligently improve public, edu- uh, not public education, but teacher education, mm-hmm. and then reduce class size, those two things, and you'd see dramatic improvements within uh, five, five years, five, six years. Yeah, and I can't help think, um, just as you're saying that, and and thinking about lectures that that you would give, or you know, classes rather. Discussions. Discussions. Let's, 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 <laughs> yeah. let's quote them well. The, the, you were very comfortable with the content. So if a student asked you something that was That's slightly, aspect, right? slightly off, to your point, you know, if if you feel informed as a teacher, then you're not afraid to kind of go outside and, and, and handle those questions or, you know, divert the class. But to your point, if, if you don't feel empowered or if you haven't been educated properly mm-hmm. or spend the time, you do feel mm-hmm. you do feel kind of contained to a box of like, I can't actually do anything else besides this path because I don't know um, how to teach yeah. those topics. And I think that's where you get... That would be a third component in teacher education. Absolutely. Yeah, that the, the teachers need to be masters of their subject. Yeah. And to your point, master the comedy, educators. Yeah, the comedy and, and the comfort and even, you know, the, the kind of acting, I think that almost comes second nature if you have mastered the content because you feel very comfortable mm-hmm. with the topic. And so when students come in, it's not, a, oh man, what was that? I was I was prepping for the, for the lecture today and I, uh, I've got my notes, but I, I don't feel prepared. Mm-hmm. And so you can't actually settle in to actually handle a discussion in a way that the kids kind of need you to be, you know, in charge of and, and, and look to you for, you know, not for, not for every answer, but to feel like you have the confidence that they can ask questions and feel like you can route them, even if you don't know. Well, every did my answer. students feel that way? Do you think? You know, I, I think it's, it, it depends. I, I think the, the tone, and I think this mm-hmm. is something you didn't talk about, but I remember walking into classes and those first, that first week was very pivotal to say, mm-hmm. what type of teacher is this? Um, Mm -hmm. How do they feel about kind of general rules, discipline, how strict are they, and do they generally have classes that are interesting, or are they pretty much like, here's your homework, here's the coursework, we're going to cover this from pages, and if so, they tend to just be less interesting in general, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually never start with uh, the syllabus. That's always the second or third day. We would start off, uh, depending on which class it is, but we would always do something very active, um, get them involved, you know, and they're waiting. They're waiting because they're going through each class that they're getting the syllabus, getting the lecture about the behavior, expectations, classroom expectations. Um, you when all the papers are going to be due, when the tests, the format, and I don't do any of that. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, some students like things to be. Um, they like to be able to connect the dots, and they come in, and when things are a little bit different than their comfort zone, right, right. Uh, but nonetheless, they 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 learn pretty quickly and they adapt pretty quickly. Uh, so it, yeah. That that idea that you just um, if they're in teacher education, where ways right to help teachers become uh, figure out how they themselves for their personality can be more engaging, and obviously not for example the different ways that I taught as a, a raconteur that means you know a storyteller, mm-hmm. and uh, trying to uh, bring in a, a species of sense of humor, um, you know usually from, it was more of, of the wit variety than a joke teller, but um, and also right you know amusing anecdotes um, either that mm-hmm. came up on the you know, the spot or had happened to me in real life or happened in history, right? Those are things that the students love to hear and to, to share those, right? But every teacher needs to find their own little niche. You know, what is it that, that, that works for them? Um, if you have a teacher that's really being unsuccessful, um, they they need to figure out, of course, in the end, how how can I affect then positively student learning? There was a, a teacher who was a very low-key, a very mellow fellow who knew his subject quite well. And he developed a system for stations in the classroom. One was involving computers. Another one was involving text, documents that they would read. Another one was a discussion group. And so they would, the students then would move. Um, they would be in groups of four or five and then move from station to station. And just that movement in the class and going from task to task and then eventually to one where they're creating a product. And he stumbled upon this system that worked wonderfully for him. 
Uh, and I tried to incorporate some because it's, it's a fantastic idea. Mm-hmm. Elements of that into my classroom. As an AP class, you can't do it really too much because, of course, you have to be able to, to – um, we have to be covering massive amounts of content right, right. in a fairly quick way. Uh, but nonetheless, for him, it was it was wonderful. It wasn't the way that I set up a classroom. Mine, again, was much more um, – you know, to use an expression that uh, teacher education, they always said, you, you don't want to be a sage on the stage. You want to be a guide on the side. And I tended to be definitely the sage on the stage more. Um, but the students loved it because it was a bit of a performance, right? Mm-hmm. And um, for them, and they were included in it. That was the idea to include them as much as possible, particularly like when we did Shakespeare, if you recall. Yeah. You had to come up in front of the class and you were reading the part and we tried to set up, set the stage, you know, for Midsummer Night's Dream, whenever we would, we would, well, you have that in that illustration that begins our show. Yeah. The green cellophane that we would put over the fluorescent lights. So we have the green wood at night and we would bring in the, the trees from the library. They have all the sparkly lights on them, the fairyland, right? And so you try to, well, do whatever you can that um, uh, piques p- people's interest, mm-hmm. gets their mind engaged, sticking it into gear, and choose your metaphor, <laughs> choose it wisely. Yeah, um, two things that that um, come to my mind. One, I remember, I remember a class I took with with you as a freshman, and it must have been the just U.S. history class, a more generic class that wasn't an AP class, mm-hmm. but our. our our, the, the class makeup was much more diverse in terms of levels of, of you know, uh, you know, education and, and as far as like mm-hmm. intelligence. Obviously, it was across the board. And I, I it must have spe- been global history. I, guess it, I occasionally it, taught that back then. It could maybe, have been. I don't know. Um, I, mean, I, yeah, I didn't generally teach, but I don't know. Yeah. yeah and so I, I, occasionally I did. I remember there was um, a fellow classmate who I played football with, and I had barely met. I think we were freshmen at the time, so it was mm-hmm. not someone I knew well, and. I think one of the things that you did well that I think also is important is this expectation setting to your point of of kind of letting the class know that, that this is an environment where we're going to do active learning and I'm going mm-hmm. to call on you to get your opinion. And even if someone didn't know the answer, I remember uh, you specifically were always very good at making sure no one felt like they, you know, mm. were, were they felt dumb or they were embarrassed. You would always do yeah, it. It's not doing anything wrong. Yeah. Do, not knowing the answer. Do it in yeah. a way where they could participate at the level they were at. And that, that, that little bit of confidence then allowed them to participate more and that would build. And over time you would really see an engaged set of everyone. Um, even if it was someone who was chiming in once a class versus someone who was, you know, chiming in multiple times. Mm-hmm. And I think that expectation setting is really helpful for students to say, this is like, yeah, it's it's expectations generally, but I don't want you to be caught off guard on the type of class I have, and I want mm-hmm. you to succeed. And I think when that's really delivered up front, um, I always appreciated that in terms of, okay, I get this teacher is a little bit different than this other class, and so I'm going to engage accordingly, and I'll probably have a better outcome because of it, both from a content perspective, from um, you know how I feel about the class, and hopefully from a you know quantitative you know score mm-hmm. or or grade. Um, and then, you know, to your point about class sizes, uh, I could not agree more in terms of, I have three young girls and they, they actually go to a charter school and the class sizes by nature tend to be smaller. Mm. And you can see when I go in for parent teacher conferences, the level of understanding of the teacher to each kid is just higher. They just, they have more time, they have more mm. capacity. And because of that, you have a better relationship between the teacher and the student. Right. And, and that's, that's integral. Yeah. And, and at, scale, at every level, not just, not yeah. just elementary school, but in high school as well to, to really make that connection. You'll see that in all those movies about American high schools. Uh, you yeah, that this notion, um, what's that, uh, which is the Perks on Being a Wallflower. Mm. It, it's funny, the, the title, it, it's a very successful book, but the movie is fantastic, really. And it, 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 it does show uh, the student having a connection with the teacher. And oftentimes when um, those students, whether their parents just don't have time or energy, either if their parents are working or they're in a one-parent household or... And it's amazing as a teacher, um, of course, the uh, what we would find out about students' backstories. And you begin to have so much more appreciation for for what the students are able to achieve. Because <laughs> you might be thinking, wow, they just they seem so tired, this particular student. Why why is he or she um, coming in here every day exhausted? And then, of course, you find out why. Mm-hmm. And this is where you then need to be a little bit more flexible yourself and figure out a way to, that you can step in. Because you can't. Uh, fix all that, yeah. unfortunately, right? But there are things that you can do where at least right now for this hour, you're going to be safe. You know, you're going to be um, in a in a happy place. Right? The happiest place on earth is that Disneyland or my classroom. <laughs> yeah, I I, empowered. Yeah. Empowered is the word that I think of. As, yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, th- yeah, that's a word, of course, you, you want. You want to be able to facilitate and empower students. 
um, give them a sense that they can achieve, uh, you know, on their own terms. And then, of course, even go beyond that, go beyond what they thought their limits were. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's, of course, an experience that every individual loves, no matter what they're doing. If they, I can't go to the top of the Eiffel Tower, climb up to the top, and then they discover that they can. Yeah. And that's a very simple thing. But uh, the notion, if you can do that, go up to the top of your educational Eiffel Tower on a daily basis. And you do. You start one, one day at a time. Um, and that is because it's long. A day in a public school in America is a very, um, it, it's an endurance test. I love that scene in Risky Business where Tom Cruise is desperate to get out of the classroom because he has to go see about his dad's Porsche that he had dumped in the lake. And uh, and he's looking at the clock, and the teacher's, uh, of course, groaning on. And he, he looks at, up, up again at the clock again, and, and it goes backwards. <laughs> and, of course, from his point of view, that's what's actually happening. He, he's seeing time is, is not just stopping, but actually going backwards. And, yeah. And, it, and that's, yeah, students. Yeah, and the, the last thing I'll say on the on the teacher aspect is you made a good comment about, you know, certain – you can't, you can't just take someone's style and their methods and, and, and copy paste and expect it to work. I think, um, I work in, in more of the tech side of the house and Google is notorious for this idea of they built this culture and they have, they have snacks and they have scooters and they were kind of the first to kind of pioneer mm-hmm. this. And so what did all tech do? They said, well, Google's got these cool, they've got, you know, casual, they've got these sweaters. They've mm-hmm. got to think about these, this swag they do. You know, there's a company here in Spokane that created the game Mist called Cyan. Yeah, yeah. And, and they actually did that. They had uh, waterfalls and fountains and sort of a forest type. And they had the, the different games. And um, so they, they had actually had already done that prior to Google's existence. We're going back to 1990 or so. So Google popularized it then and stole it from yeah. them. So, and, and well, I think- yeah, I think it's yeah the workplace. <laughs> but yeah, if you can make your classroom. I tried to at times. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, re- remake the architecture. If I, if I were teaching French, you know, I would set it up like a French village. Yeah. I would basically have it, you know, so you would have a bakery and then you would have to... In order to get your book, your textbook, you'd have to go to the bank and get some money and then go to the bookstore and buy it and be able to say this stuff in French from day one. Yeah. And, and, I, so and, I, and I think it's the same thing on the, on the, on the company side is they, people started copying this and they said, oh, well, if we have these things, we're going to, we're going to get, you know, people who love our culture. And, and they thought that these yeah. things equated to culture and it really wasn't. It was, you know, you've got to actually build a place that's from the ground up, something that you, that's organic. And I think teaching's the yeah. same way. You can't expect, Not artificial. To, you can't copy paste someone else's style. You need to actually take from, to your point, take from those who do things successfully and glean from that and then apply it in a way that's your own and unique. And I think those are where I found the most interesting teachers are ones that have a style that takes elements of, of great teachers, but it's uniquely their own and they found a way to make it their own. Absolutely. Yeah. Their own voice, their own idiom, and they bring it into the classroom and, and students can, they, they're um, very sharp and they can spot a fake very easily. Uh, and so even younger kids, of course, and, and that's you know, straight to your point about, um, and that's also to, you know, to the notion, right, that every teacher is going to have, there is no single one, you know, no single formula that works for teaching. You know, that's where to talk about the objectivity of teaching, you know, what, what makes a teacher good objectively? Well, there's no single answer to that because there is no single methodology, no single you know, formula. Use the word scaffolding, foundation, what you will, mm-hmm. uh, any of those things, uh, it, it runs the gamut. Now, so there are certain outcomes, of course, which you want to have in common. And um, and that's where standardized tests at the state level, uh, we just don't do that very well in this country. Other countries have been doing it forever. That's the way they teach. That's the way their educational system is designed. And so we have to actually change the fundamental nature of our educational system when we artificially implant a new standardized test that the students have to pass at grade four, grade eight, and grade 11. You know, we did that for years here, over a decade in the state of Washington. And... Um, so I think, uh, yeah, we, we need to um, somehow develop this American way, this American yeah. ethos and idiom and um, run with that. And what is, it's, there's so much leeway within that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this, um, obviously, we're re-recording the, the intro episode again. And I think we've touched on a lot of the points that we did originally. And I think our goal of, of kind of what we wanted to stay is we start this venture together and kind of hopefully bring people mm-hmm. into this little bit of, of our podcast slice. So um, we want to talk about i think we're going to start so from your point as a foundation we're going to start with the greeks so we're going to start yeah. with um episodes and start from kind of the golden age and i think to your point kind of the where western civilization is probably most prominently impacted from that history and all things kind of lead out from there um, yeah, we have the values we have their basically the shape of our society comes from them 2500 years ago 
Yeah, one one comment, I guess, one last thing that, and this is something I'll probably address. I know I'm going to address in the future because I did address it in a future episode. But if you look at, um, in German, there's a great word, a great vocabulary word, and they, they love their compound words in German, but they have a Lebenskunstler. Was ist ein Lebenskunstler? Ein, Leben, ein Lebenskunstler ist, it's a, it means life artist, an artist of life. And what that means is that a person, an individual, is to take their own life and look upon it as a work of art that they are creating on a daily basis. That they, you can look upon it as a each, you know, each day is a little piece of this work of art. You know, may, you can look upon it, I guess, a, as a huge novel that's never going to end that you add to it each day. Um, or like Michelangelo with his, I always say Michelangelo because that's Michelangelo in Italian or Michelangelo is what we say right. in this country. But there he is with the Sistine Chapel ceiling for nearly three years, right? Night after night. The paint, you know, splattering down on his face. And you'd always say that his face was a splendid palette for what colors and what he was painting that particular night. And he would have the candle wax, right, as he stuck the candle right on his forehead. Uh, but nonetheless, this notion that um, approaching your life as a work of art, that you are the artist and you don't want to let anyone else become the artist of your life. Not your parents, not your teachers, not your boss, not your president. This idea that you, of course, in the end, are alone in your life and you want to be the artist of your life. In French, l'artiste de vie, you know, the artist of life. And they have the same concept, this idea, right, that you are in the, and you want to have, it, it bring in beauty and all these various elements, right, that you see that are necessary, part and parcel to a great work of art. And the idea that you are the one who gets to shape this. And of course, that's, and, um, you discover that more and more as you get older, that in high school, they really are transitioning to the point where they're going to be independent very soon. And uh, that this is a reality that they, that, the, and also this idea too, which is just absolutely necessary in young people, is that this is not a preparation for life, what we're doing in high school or middle school or elementary school. Life has already begun. And this, you'll see this in a lot of different stories and books and in good movies. But this idea that this, it's not a dress rehearsal. High school is not a dress rehearsal for college, and then college is a dress rehearsal for life. Uh, life is going. It, it's something which is, um, you know, from the, your first breath, when you got that whack on your behind. And it begins, you know, day one. You know, the, the great English philosopher, political philosopher John Locke said that we're blank slates when we're born. And life begins writing on our blank slate the, the day we're born. Now, Plato, the ancient Greek guy, um, 2,300 years before John Locke had a very different idea about how we learned that we're born into this world um, you know, prior to life. And this is maybe a good segue into go from the notion of the artist of life to uh, someone who believed in philosopher kings and, and living his life like a work of art and philosophy, Plato. But he said we were all exposed to all of it before we were born, that the soul is eternal and that the soul kind of goes to sleep when it's born into this material world and then slowly begins to wake up and remember all the eternal truths that it was in touch with before it was born. And this is one of those things that the Greeks actually got into 2,500 years ago. And it's so far beyond what we tend to get. You know, that's, wow, that's abstract and that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. What else did you do with that idea? And if you can get, of course, uh, an audience to actually want to ask that question and get to the answer, well, you have to tune in next time for everyone listening in um thanks for joining subscribe follow the podcast so we can get updates um i'm ryan this is my good friend eric or as i call it the best teacher i've ever had ah uh, thank you all right Phew. <sighs>